So it's not going to be a presentation, really. We just have some images that we might want to show, depending on what we're talking about. Um, so, start. Yeah. Okay. So we wanted to make this as a file for chat and not only talk about Leonardo AI, but actually talk about how generative AI uh, is today for game gaming business for mobile game studios <laughs> and game studios in general. Uh, and uh, Sunny is the perfect person to have this discussion with. He has been in generative AI for a while and he's one of the founders of uh, Leonardo. And so why don't we start by an uh, introduction? Yeah, sure. So my name is Sami. I'm a machine learning researcher. I am one of the co-founders of Leonardo AI. Um, we're a content production suite, um, and we have multiple tools for asset creation. And we use generative AI mostly for 2D assets, but we also have a little bit of um, 3D solutions. So we have a texturing tool, for example, that is fully UV aware, so you can you can you know texture a model. And if your 3D modeler has like a very nice UV layout for those. Uh, it will be respected. And now we're venturing a little bit into video as well. It's coming soon, uh, TM. Um, yeah, soon to be on the platform as well. Yeah, and just to give a short introduction of myself. So, my name is Oz, and I have been in machine learning and AI for the last six years, since 2017. Mm -hmm. And with different things uh, to gaming, like bots, with reinforcement learning, with uh, LTV, you know, as, like different uh, like analytic stuff. And since a few months, I'm, I'm helping the other in Europe, basically. So anybody that has questions afterwards can contact either of us. So, Sami, so how, how did the... Can you talk a little bit about uh, Genetic AI, like how it came to today, like in the last... Uh, let's say like a year or two? Yeah, I mean, there's been a few models that have been out there that had a little bit of attention um, to them. I think we actually have a few examples in here as well. Um, I think the first one was uh, Google's Deep Dream that came up. It, it looked kind of psychedelic um, and was not really useful for any kind of content production. But it was cool. It, might, it, it was like a yeah, psychedelic experiment. Um, this one caught a lot of attention. And then the next one um, were VQGAN and Clip. And I think Clip is one of the, the bigger inventions that we had at the time because it's basically supporting all the other models that came afterwards as well. Um, it's basically a model that can um, yeah, look at the, the similarity between text and, and image. And yeah, that's basically one of the more important building blocks for all of the text to image models. Um, yeah, and then we had uh, Disco Diffusion. This one is uh, one that is very dear to my heart because it's how I got started with generative AI, basically. I mean, I've, I worked with GANs in, in, my, in my masters, and, um, but this is the first, the first one that really you know, caught the attention of most people because it was the first very uh, yeah, usable diffusion model. And, and as you can see, it's not very coherent and it's uh, yeah, long. Uh, is long shot from the quality and the, the coherence that we have in, in, in nowadays diffusion models. Um, and I say nowadays because th this is from 2021, it's not that long ago, but we still have you know, made strides um, in, in the quality and the, the speed especially. So for disco diffusion, as an example, depending on the image size, uh, it took between uh, 15 minutes and one and a half hours to generate one image. So that's very much unusable in any kind of production. Um, but the way I found it, for example, and how I got into generative AI is uh, that I was working on a small collectible card game just in my free time, and I'm a shit artist, so I really needed something, you know, that uh, translated my programmer's art into, you know, like something that's... Uh, it was a project for fun, but still I wanted to look at something nice. And I found this good diffusion. And yeah, for me, it was the, the perfect, you know, catch. I, I was hooked immediately, and I knew I had to go into this, and that's also how we found it. Um, yeah, Leonardo AI, because our CEO, he also has a gaming studio. So uh, Leonardo AI actually arose from the need of, you know, a tool to iterate quickly, to, you know, do some visual explorations um, in the creation of art, and this, in this case for cards as well. And yeah, that's how we found each other basically also online. Um, we found each other on Discord and then, um, yeah, then, you know, Stable Diffusion came along. Ah, oh, this is Midjourney, of course. Everybody knows Midjourney, probably. Uh, Popular ones, ah, there we go. One of the more popular ones, um, and then also uh, stable diffusion, also probably known by 
most people. Um, yeah, but that's that's uh, you know with the Stable Diffusion XL 1.0, that's the the most recent addition to the Stable Diffusion family. Um, that's where we are today in the history of of generative models. So we could say that over time, uh, like quantum solubility got and quality and speed improved with each of these iterations. So now you can generate uh, images like very fast, even using APIs and uh, like the scope. Uh, the technology is becoming faster and more controllable. Yeah, sure. So if we look at Midjourney, um, the stuff that comes out of Midjourney is amazing, right? Uh, the, the, the model quality is great and the images look just insane. But I think what Midjourney is lacking is a little bit of the controllability that you just mentioned. So if you want to use it in production, uh, it can mostly take a text prompt, but no other conditioning. Or like, I think they, they actually are working on it, but there's only little... Um, possibilities of conditioning and that was something that we had in mind with Leonardo because you know our CEO actually has a game studio and they, they, he knows you know what they need in term, terms of controllability um, so we could develop everything in with this you know, with this control in mind so we we try to make as many controls as possible available we have like multi conditioning we have images that you can condition it with um, we have in painting and out painting tools and I think this is something that might be that the most useful for the production use. You know, if you have like a product image, for example, you want to just exchange the background for it. Uh, you can have masking tools, and that's something that arose like recently. We have like more and more conditioning mechanisms and, and uh, techniques uh, that you can use to yeah to exert more control over the generation process. Not only like before you press the generate button, but also afterwards, like pro post processing. You can take an image, you can transform it into something else. You can change the style. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, you get more and more control. Over the images. So, so what are the uh, key, let's say, use cases for, for a game studio? Then, that because there are many, we have many users, like more than five million people are actually using Leonardo now. What are the ones that come up to mind for you? So, for me, generative AI is all about being a useful tool, and I would never see it as a replacement for an artist, for example. So. Um, what I imagine generated by AI being is some tool that you can use to speed up your workflow, for example. So if you have a task that's very uh, repetitive, let's say you may be an environment artist, right? You, you, you're painting an environment and you have like a lot of bricks in the cityscape or like roof tiles, or you have, um, I don't know, a forest scene with little, little leaves, a lot of little leaves, then you can have an AI that basically inpaints these very repetitive tedious areas for you and you can maybe focus more on the composition and and you know focus on the colors and making sure that the storytelling you know is supporting the 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 scene that you're basically working on or if you're maybe maybe you're an art director and you want to do some visual exploration of some concepts you know you can throw it into an AI you can iterate very quickly and that's that's exactly like um, how our sister studio does it, for example, when they work on their cards or consumables, they have like a concept communication. Exactly, yeah. So the art director can, you know, explore a concept and then go to the artist when, when he's done, um, you know, exp exploring their vision. Um, and the other thing that I think is maybe use useful, and um, maybe we have an example of that as well. Yeah, so you could, you could fine tune on some kind of concept. So we also offer training on the, on the platform, for example. And this is one example where we trained on medieval helmets or fantasy helmets. And yeah, this just makes it very easy to, you know, iterate on on variations as well. So maybe, you know, you want to populate something like warehouse level and your art director says, hey, we need 50 variations of barrels or crates or whatever, something very tedious. If you train on something, you know, like of, 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 on a data set of barrels and crates, that can, you know, save you some time on this, this you know, iteration and uh, having to sit down and, you know, like, change something here, change something there, but you can generate something and then you can actually take that image and put it into the model again and, you know, recreate um, variations of something that you already uh, yeah, generated. How many items typically you need to train? So it's, it's different. Um, for training, it's always different of what you want to achieve. So if you want to do variations of an item, you know, you can, you can um, go between 5 to 25 images, that will give you variations of one item, but it will look very similar to the one before. If you want to train on a specific art style, I think we also have an... Yeah, this is this is an example from the game that uh, uh, the company of my CEO also does. It's a, it's a collectible card game. 
And what they did is they, they trained on a bunch of cards that they already created to capture their art style. And for those, you typically need a little bit more, so you have like this wide-ranging, uh, you know, capturing the, the style of the artist. Um, yeah, this is some of the examples that they that they came up with. Um, you can go um, to as much as a thousand images or even more. It, it always depends on how much data you also have. But for a, for a single concept, you know, if you want to basically make a fun model of your face, for example, like five, five images would be enough. Any more use cases? Yeah, I mean, like in gener generative AI, for example, there's there's way more. Like, if you could do like general, like just general exploration, you know, you can train on a specific concept and just like have variations of that. Of course, um, you can create concept art, like you know, big big environments, just just to set the scene or like mood boards, right? You can, yeah, you can just create that it's, uh, fantastic landscapes and, and, and uh, environments. And even you can see here that you have these areas with a lot of like nitty gritty details. That you, you can you can just inpaint those, right? If you have an artist that already did a model in uh, uh, an image, and, and you like part, you don't like parts of it, for example, you can just mask them out and and you know regenerate those. Um, and one other example would be I think um, yeah this one, where you can take two images that kind of fit together but but don't 100 percent. And I, I think I'm sitting in front of the screen a little bit, but you can see you can you know just merge these images, um, yeah, basically by yeah by, by combining them and have the model connect the, the two images that are unconnected here. Um, something else would be just you know sketch your image. You just you just scribble something, turns you into an image. Um, the this is um, what uh, the wife of one of our co-founders she painted this, and then we turned this into this nice. Um, Scenery, and of course you don't have to be a professional to use generative AI. You know, like like for me working on the card game, for example, that was just for fun. Um, or I'm I'm playing a, a weekly Dungeons and Dragons game, for example, and um, we use that we use in this case Leonardo. We just use it for you know to recreate the scenes that we came across in the in our story. And and our dungeon master, you know, he he uses it to create the items that we find, or the NPCs that we encounter, or just land, the landscape that we walk through. And I, I quite like seeing actually, you know, my friends who are not very artistically inclined, just like me. I'm I'm very bad at art, as I said before. But I can I really like seeing them now being able to create and to express themselves, you know, in a way that they have previously not been able to. You know, like every, everybody is busy. They have kids, and you, you typically, typically don't have the time to sit down and you know after you didn't paint didn't paint for the for your whole life to sit down and you know scribble or something. But, but with this technology, you can just, you know, you can express yourself a little differently than, than you were before. Yeah, I think self of course, using generative AI, sorry, using generative AI as a tool is like what comes up to, comes to mind first, but the equally important self-expression. And uh, that's for the artist that's designing the game, but also potentially users. So user-generated content can be uh, enabled by generative AI, so that using an API in the game, you can uh, generate images. Is that correct? And yeah. there are many use cases for this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one thing I like about this, I mean, we have, um, we have, this is an example, we have this texturing tool as well, where you can upload a model and, uh, you know, it generates skins for you. You can, you can basically, you know, have um, user-generated skins for the weapon in your ego shooter or, uh, you know, third-party uh, person. You can generate skins for your characters, um, and one thing I really like about this is, um, you know, in games, typically, of course, it's a, it's a creative hobby because you can kind of, you know, uh, influence the story of the game you're playing with the actions that you're taking in the game, but usually you're not in a creative setting, so you, you're not expecting to go into a game and being the person that is the creator of something that is, you know, inside the game. Of course, you know, if you look at Baldur's Gate or you know, all of these RPGs, there's some customization options for your character, of course, but it's still only to the level of you know what the developers allow you to, you know, create in, inside the game. But now with user-generated content that is basically, um, you know, text prompt dependent or like user input dependent, I quite like that. Now you have the the opportunity to, you know, express yourself, um, basically completely freely. But the game developers can still, you know, offer you a model that is trained on the in-game art style. So you're not breaking the immersion. You're not breaking, you know, the out of the universe that the game developers have given you, but you're still basically able to express yourself however you want. 
Um, and yeah, that's that's a part of VGC that I'm kind of excited about for sure to see this more and more in games. Would that the game the game developer would have to say in a model if their style? Yeah, exactly. And then uh, give the access to the. User. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it doesn't have to be visible to the user either, right? You don't have to know that you're now using something that is, you know, I know running on an external API or something, but you can just have, you know, describe the armor that you're wearing, and then you describe the armor that you're wearing, and then, you know, sometimes your character is blue and red, and sometimes it's wearing, more, I don't know, like, more, more reflective, whatever the user comes up with. And then, you know, you maybe empathize with the character even more than just, you know, exchanging hairstyles or haircuts. Yeah. What are the limitations today? Yeah, of course there's some limitations and um, I mean some of it is the controllability that I've talked about before and I think it kind of comes down to the consistency that you have in models. So I think um, using generative AI in games in general is going to pose a few more, you know, uh, QA questions to game developers than have before. So if you maybe look at something like a, a you know interactive AI chatbot, um, you're gonna have to think of completely new Q and A strategies because now that's just a live service in a game, right? And there's no you know if you generate an image, you have some content moderation that you can go through before you actually put it to the game. But if you have a live service like a chatbot, you kind of have to make sure that now your you know like. Uh, watermelon merchant doesn't suddenly start talking about cars in a medieval game because you need something to transport the wares with. So th there's going to be, I think, a lot of um, new problems for game designers and uh, you know, Q&A uh, engineers to, to, uh, you know, that they're going to struggle with when they want to employ this kind of stuff in a live game. And I think another limitation, but it's, it's one that we're very close to, to, uh, yeah, to conquering, basically, is that if you want to have consistent images of the same character that always look the exact same, there's still some problems with the image generators. Um, you know, sometimes you know they're wearing, wearing something that looks a little bit different. Sometimes the haircut looks a little bit different. The face has like slight variations in it. Um, so it's, it's great for you know visual exploration, but it, there might be you know issues if you want to have a storyboard or something and you want to make sure that everything looks the exact same in every frame. Yeah, but, but I think we're making great strides for it, especially if you look at, you know, text-to-video, like Runway ML, for example, they have a great video, um, you know, generator that you can do, like, text-to-video. And the characters, um, they, they, they look exactly the same in every frame. So I think there's, there's great strides being made, and uh, that's something that's going to be solved very, very quickly. Um, yeah, and another limitation, I mean, we have a texturing solution, but generating 3D, it's not quite there yet. There's more and more uh, things coming out. Actually, last week, I think three papers came, came out that uh, showed some text to 3D stuff. But, um, yeah, I don't know if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a 3D artist, you're going to see that the topology definitely still needs some work. And um, the auto-generated UVs, I think, is also not, not, not quite there yet. Which is actually something I hear all the time. When, I, when you go around conferences, everybody just wants read topology and UVs. But um, it's not a sexy problem, so I'm, I'm not sure how many people are looking at it at, at this moment. But yeah, it's something that I would be interested in to uh, also take a look at, because uh, that's that's the more tedious work from from what I hear from artists. Any question? Any other question? Yeah, let's see. I don't know. This is uh, we can we can go through here. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Speaking of consistency, that's something you know where we have a little bit more control. We, we, we can put in a pose, for example. We can put in depth maps. We can put in normal maps. So if you have something where you block something out, maybe with a 3D model program like Blender, for example, you can use those images for conditioning as well. Um, yeah, model sheets, this one works. Um, this will actually give you some consistent characters, um, but it's still something, if, you know, for example, on the very left, she has a ponytail once, but only once. In the other images, she doesn't have one yet. But, but it's something that we're getting very close to solving. Uh, and we're putting a lot of research in as well. Yeah, these are just a little uh, few um, example images um, from what we have on the platform right now. Like, it's a photoreal model that we have. Um, this one is very good at generating photorealistic images. Yeah, exactly. And nice landscapes. Good. So I think so. We went over different use cases, like how. 
like what they are at in general Genetic AI is offering today, applications. And, uh, are there any questions? Is anybody using Genetic AI for game development? We can also show our like, graph uh, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, I think so. So if you if you want to try a generative, a generative AI, we have a um, little uh, token booster for you if you want to use it um, on our website. It gets you 5,000 free tokens if you sign up. Does it work from that file? We never tested it. Well, 10 meters. It's working? Okay, it's not working. <laughs> when we step off stage, then we just take the chairs away. Sure. So, sir, you can. I'm interested just in the part of uh, the cost. <clears throat> For example, if I uh, want to generate uh, maybe 1,000 images uh, representing. I mean, I work on Web3 NFT and all that, so we are thinking about maybe using this for generating NFT images. So if we want to generate maybe similar, we give the, to the AI some examples of things we want and in a style, how much would it cost us to really generate 1,000 of these, these images? Um, so so we, the way that we do it, we have basically we have uh, um, different plans that we can, we can talk about this later as well. Like we have different plans where we offer a certain amount of tokens. And then, depending on the service that we have on the website, so we have model training, we have like some post-processing tools like upscaling, uh, background removal, stuff like this. They have different token costs, and also like they, they vary um, depending on the size of the image that you want to generate. Just because you know, like the bigger the image, the higher the compute. So it it, it does kind of vary um, depending on what you want to generate. Yeah. How many images did you say? A thousand images. One thousand similar style. That's like. Less than fifty dollars. Yeah, I'm not so it's not. It's less than fifty dollars. I think it's like. Less than hundred dollars. Less than fifty dollars. So not a. How difficult is is that to use for a for not a We have. We, I mean, yeah, we have a um, website. So it's like we have a very nice UI, in my opinion. It's like very. It's pretty easy to use. We also have an API. So if you're interested in you know like connecting to other services that you already have. We can also offer that, like for UGC, for example, if you want to, you know, like generate something from a game or something, you know, input a user profile picture and spit out something in the outside of the game. Um, we can also do that, and we also have an, uh, an iOS app, so it's it's pretty simple to use. No, no, not at all. You just have to be able to type English. Yes. Yeah. The, actually, the thing that is. Like one of the strong points of Leonardo is, is user interface. That's how it got wide adoption. And the other, I think there are some screenshots of our user interface. So so this is a part of our user interface, for example. There are tutorial videos, and uh, the community is quite big. There's like more than five million users, and they even some of them even made like Udemy courses on how to use it. So, uh, in addition to our own tutorials, there's a lot of material on YouTube on. Different channels. Easy to use and easy to find to learn. Yeah. Any other questions? Sure. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. Um, I was curious because you mentioned you use the AI for pictures. Uh, for a card game, which is actually what I'm doing right now. I'm developing a deck builder and we've also been using AI to like generate the first cards and Consistency is the biggest problem, right? They all look like they are from different universes Even though you try to describe that it's like supposed to look similar or whatever. Maybe you could expand a little bit on um, how you did this with having a few drawn cards then feeding them to the AI and then when did the art style become better? Did you actually achieve consistency or close to it or, yeah? Yeah, so the way that it worked, uh, so this game is made by Rainy and the Lords of Light, so the Lords of Light. So what, the way they did it is that they had an artist, before they used Gen AI, they had an artist, or like multiple artists, and they still do, they're not replaced. 
they're just using AI as a tool now. But basically what they did is train a model on the art style. So they just fed, like, a, I don't know how many cards it was. I don't know if it says on the... They just used 15 cards. They, they go. Yeah, that's very little. That's, that's very little, yeah. And um, yeah, train on their art style. And that was basically enough to get the consistent art style. So what, what really helps with when you train a model is if you use like a new keyword to the model that is then used to basically describe the style that you want. So when you train that model and then you want to re regenerate something in the same style, you use that keyword and that will help strongly to, to get that uh, consistent art style. I mean, we, we do offer model training. Um, you, can, you can try our platform as well. Um, and we can also um, help you with that. We have some model trainers employed that maybe you can you know, uh, help you with that as well. Yeah, thank you. Let's expand on that later. Yeah. Any other question? If there's no question, I'll just ask, since we have like three more minutes, is anybody waiting to use generative AI like for some capability, like imagining like what they could do, they, like a wish of what they would like to do in game development? Okay, <laughs> let's hear it. Yeah, so, not use the generative AI for our... Yes. Uh, we want to use the generative AI for our mobile game, for the usually for uh, more icons and in-game assets, usually for the 2D games, and maybe for a hybrid casual games. And actually, like the previous question, like the consistency is the issue. Like when you work with the, a couple freelancer artists, it's really hard to achieve the, that consistency level, and. Actually, we are expect to, expected to uh, reach with that some generative AI and create most of resources with that. And maybe use this, maybe we can use this AI. Yes, 2D and icons is usually able to use it. Yeah, so um, UI elements is actually a very interesting use case in my opinion, because um, I, was, I was talking to one of our model trainers about this as well, um, and I tasked her to, to do something, because I don't think there's any UI models out there yet. And I think it's a great use case. So um, in general, like what we offer is, you know, like uh, multi conditioning. So if you, for example, have something uh, like a shape that you input, that will, you know, keep it consistent with that shape. So you can basically design the button just in the way it kind of, you know, is shaped, and then you know generate the the graphics on top of that conditioning. That will help. But in general, as you know, with uh, with him as well, it, it will greatly help if you have like some style that you can train it on beforehand. What we also have is um, something called image prompts, where you can give like an example image, and it will infer some of the style stylistic elements from it. Can we create like uh, gave some rival games to the feed the AI and generate similar assets with them? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's nice. We can Thank you. discuss that. And you had a. Last question. No, just because you asked who's planning on using generative AI for the game, and obviously I did. Yes, of course. Sorry. Well, I can't, but I want like this. There we go. We can show it. Like just after the. Yeah, we just finished up, so we can show it from the force. All right. We just can use it here. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.